Alabama going down. Jalen Milrow trying to get a miracle drive in. Will Brooks with the interception. Tennessee, Rocky Top Nation, they outlast. Roll Tide, 24 to 17. Alabama fans are stunned. A really forgetful day for Jalen Milrow. 25 of 45, right? Two interceptions. And then on the other side, it was really Dylan Sampson who carried them in that second half. 139 rushing yards. Chris Brazel had the game winning, the go ahead score. Late in the fourth, great ball from Nico Iamaleava. And Alabama, two losses before November. First time that's happened since 2007. You know that year was? Nick Saban's first year as Alabama's head coach. Time now for our Alabama-Tennessee recap presented by Belfort Property Restoration. Joining me to break it all down, CBS Sports College football writer Richard Johnson in studio and CBS Sports College football analyst Chip Patterson. And gentlemen, let's be frank. This game was not pretty, especially in the first <laughs> half. It was, uh, hey, you know, you talk about Georgia, Alabama, it was the complete opposite. And when you look at Bama, Richard, they had all these opportunities in the first half to really blow Tennessee out the water. Instead, they failed to. And then Tennessee flipped the script a little bit in the second half. What did you see as a key difference from Tennessee's offense? Yeah, don't let anybody look at the helmets on the field and tell you this was a good game because it was a close game. That's just not what happened. This was a sloppy game. This was a game played by two flawed teams who are just not what you thought they were earlier in the season. For Alabama, they are not the team that you saw for the first 30 to 40 minutes of the Georgia game. They are just not that team. Tennessee, they're not the team that we thought they were when they blew out NC State earlier in the season. They're two flawed teams, and you saw two flawed teams play a mucky, yucky game today. Yeah, I'm going to go into this, and I'm going to remember that Alabama is a talented team that is not playing winning football. They are horrendous when it comes to the details. They are not at all good at the things that you need to do to be mentally dialed in to win games that are won at the margins. When they have a talent advantage, like they were able to do against Wisconsin or against a lot of the non-conference schedule, well then, hello Jalen Milrow, hello Ryan Williams, hello this big talent advantage. But now that they've had to start playing comparable talent, the fact that they don't do well at being able to keep themselves from the costly penalties. Alabama entered the game ranked outside of the top 100 nationally in penalties per game and penalty yards per game. And what do we see here in an absolute flag fest penalties everywhere? Costly penalties again hurting Alabama. Uh, their execution is poor. Uh, their focus is poor. It is something that is remarkable to see a team that still to my eye has individuals that can be excellent and yet together as a group uh, not not fantastic. And to back up what RJ said, I mean, look, what does the NC State win mean after we see what NC State has become? What does the Oklahoma win mean when we see what Oklahoma has become? Tennessee wins this and they need it in terms of their overall profile. But for 44 minutes of game time, they had seven points. That offense ain't fixed. That offense is still in a funk. Thank goodness they've got James Pierce Jr. and a nasty defensive front to be able to help them win the game because, uh, yeah, Tennessee won, but, but I think they were just the crab that got just a little bit higher out of the barrel. You know, you look at Jalen Milrow's stat line, it says 25 of 45. Ten of those incompletions were thrown to Ryan Williams, and he didn't catch it. Ryan Williams goes eight receptions for 18 targets, and this is not to bag on Ryan Williams. He's an exceptional player. Why I bring this up is Ryan Williams is the only thing this offense has as far as mm. easy production for Alabama. So Jalen Milrow is force feeding him the ball. And look, I'd probably force feed the ball to Ryan Williams too if I was Jalen Milrow, but it just goes to show they just don't have weapons. All they've got is Ryan Williams down there somewhere, and they weren't able to generate enough points to win this game. And the interception at the end of the game... I, you know, you hate to bag on Jalen Miller because he, he is an exceptional athlete. But when you put the ball in his hands and you need him to be a passer, you see what you got on that play, that final pass that was the interception. He throws it behind the receiver, coming across the middle of the field. 
If he can't throw the ball accurately in the middle of the field, you're not going to win games in the Southeastern Conference. You're not going to go to the college football playoff. This was the mark against him, right? Throwing short and intermediate throws. He can throw the deep ball, but the intermediate throws, there were so many times, Richard and Chip, where he had Ryan Williams open, <laughs> wide open, and he just completely missed him, whether it was because of the pass rush or his feet weren't set. And when you look at the totality of Alabama, Chip, what has changed for this team, not just on offense, but also on defense, from the first half of that game against Georgia? Well, I mean, defensively, I, I never really thought that this team was there. I just thought that they had not yet played um, any any opponents that could really expose some of those flaws, especially when it came to trying to push the ball down the field. I think that offensively, they, there really is a lack of confidence um, as they go out there and as they try to handle their business. And I think that maybe you could even, if, if I can recklessly speculate uh, from my seat here, the fact that Kendrick Law is frustrated and he gets himself flagged for a personal foul penalty, you know, jawing a little bit with the Tennessee defender there at the end of the game. I just, I just don't see a unit that is operating with any kind of confidence and knowing what they do. I don't see an offensive line that is getting the kind of push that you would expect given some of the talent there. You know, they are very much reliant on hitting those home runs. And as you know, Richard pointed out about the, uh, the over reliance on Ryan Williams. I mean, that is something that we expect from teams that are in the middle of their conference teams that are not competing for championships. When you just have that, that easy button and you keep hitting it enough, you just hope that one thing, is going to hit. We are used to seeing teams that compete for championships having a little bit of balance, being able to throw you one thing and then a counter. And it just doesn't look like Alabama is has been able to do that over the course of the last couple of weeks. You know, whether it's Vanderbilt or South Carolina, and certainly here against Tennessee. Uh, well, you know, what has changed since the the beginning of that Georgia game? I, I think that Alabama came out with a great script. And now that everybody has, has kind of settled into how they want to defend Jalen Milrow, uh, we still have yet to see a really strong counter. Chip, let's not let Tennessee off the hook here either. I understand Tennessee wins this game, and obviously you'd rather win the game than lose, but Tennessee's warts are still very much here. Nico Iamaliava, now he goes down in this game, he comes back, but you're still seeing the missed deep balls. He did hit one. That was big. And look, eventually <laughs> you're going to hit one. Eventually you'd think you'd hit one, and he did. But the deep ball are still not connecting for Tennessee. He's still not accurate when you drop eight and you flood coverage with bodies. He's still not accurate. He's still not on time. I think Tennessee is still missing a some kind of playmaker in the passing game to emerge. Thank goodness they have Dylan Sampson. He almost has 150 yards in this game. He's the pace setter mm -hmm. for them. He's able to give them a reliable offense, an efficient offense. We know that this Tennessee offensive line I don't think is as good as it was last year. So, you know, I think both both teams, this is what you got. I mean, I, maybe one of them will get better coming home, but this is what you got. And, and do not tell me that this Alabama team is a top 12 team when all is said and done. A two-loss team is going to get in the college football playoff. I think multiple two-loss teams are going to get in the college football playoff, but I don't think this two-loss team, the Crimson Tide, gets in the college football playoff. They are just not this team that went all the way up on Georgia and then hung on. So, Richard, I want to start with you and then, Chip, I'll get your thoughts. So you believe that the way Alabama looks right now, even if they are able to perhaps run the table, that they wouldn't be in because of what you've seen so far? Because they do have a chance to take down LSU. They already have the win against Georgia. Missouri, we talked about it off air. They're a fraudulent team, but they're still ranked, so that could help them. What do you see as any type of path for Alabama to make it to the college football playoff because right now they're not they're not winning the SEC championship barring a miracle. Well, they would have to drop the hammer and beat everybody on this schedule by like 40 points. And like I don't think they are offensively proficient enough to play Oklahoma and beat Oklahoma by 40 points. They're better than Oklahoma because Oklahoma's not going to score in that game. But I don't think they're good enough to drop the hammer in that game, Chris. That's what they're going to need. They're going to have to rack up style points because they got a bad loss against Vanderbilt. They look like garbage garbage in this game losing. They look like garbage last week in a win over South Carolina. So again, I, 
just because it's got a script A on the side of the helmet doesn't mean you have to automatically insert them into a top 12 or what have you. You've got to judge the results on the field. And I, I've been harping on this, this segment, and I'm going to harp on it and harp on it on harp on it. Just because they were opening up a can on Georgia for about two and a half quarters does not mean that is the team they really are. So I don't think they're going to beat LSU. Not the way that they're playing right now. Like, I, I don't think that they have enough cohesion to be able to go into Baton Rouge and to win that game, especially if Garrett Nussmeyer is, uh, is, is running hot. Uh, you know, he's uh, it, he has um, seemingly gotten this offense back on track. They're getting healthier at wide receiver. I just, uh, the Crimson Tide have a game against Missouri, a, a very banged up Missouri team that is so far from anything that we expected. And then they've got an off week. And that off week is maybe the biggest week of Kalen DeBoer's first season as head coach of the Alabama Crimson Tide because he has to get this Alabama team dialed in to play LSU in the last big statement game that they will have because this Crimson Tide team is likely not competing for an SEC championship. They are competing to try to be an at-large in the college football playoff, and there is zero path to that, in my opinion, unless they're able to go into Baton Rouge and beat LSU. If they don't get things straightened out during that off week before going to Baton Rouge, then I think they're just going to lose that game, and then we don't even have to have that conversation about a two-loss team that doesn't look good. You no, know, that would just be a three-loss team that you know really, really is short on the kind of wins that are going to put you over the top. Especially if they end up having a 15 penalty, 115 yards performance like mm. they did on this Saturday night. Unacceptable from Alabama. Chip Patterson, Richard Johnson, y'all are far from unacceptable. Y'all are the pros. Yeah. Yeah, not looking good for Kalen DeBoer as you look at notable Alabama head coaches in their first season. So, DeBoer so far 5-2. and two. Nick Saban in 07, 7-6. And, and it got a lot better. So, perhaps Kalen can do that than Bear Bryant. In 1958, he went 5-4. And one. So the sky may be falling now, but perhaps greener pastures are on the way for Kalen DeBoer as Alabama head coach.